Hi there and welcome to our channel. This is a little video to walk you through some of our history game schooling tools. I hope you enjoy it. Welcome. So in our game schooling series, I want to kind of give you a sense of some of the games that we have been playing lately. Um, this is one that we've been using for history. We are doing ancient history right now. So this really worked well for our Egypt unit. Um, it says that the game is for two to four players, 10 and up. Now, we've been playing it with our six and a half year old and she can play it just fine. So I do tend to think that the age ranges on games are a bit high for what they really need to be. Imhotep, and I will give you a little glance inside the box. It's a really beautiful game where your object is to take these little boats from the quarries where you have different colored rocks so everyone gets to be a different color over to different um, building sites along the Nile. So you have the pyramid, the obelisk, the temple, the burial chamber, and then the marketplace where you get to buy cards that give you different bonuses. So all of those are scored differently and you move around a little scoring board. Very simple gameplay. A six-year-old can definitely understand it and parents are just as enthralled by the gameplay. Um, so very good game. I also love the box. It's beautiful and really easy storage. It didn't come with all the bags that we use for storage, but it definitely came with enough that you could store everything very easily. So this is Timeline Challenge. This is the big board game in the Timeline series. They also have these much less expensive little tins. Um, and they have a square tin for the Coraline series, which is kind of the sister series to this. And they all come with, ah, they all come with basically these little cards that give you on one side the event with the year and on the other side the event without the year. So whether you do the standard gameplay or not, and there are several different games you can play with these cards, um, they're just really great little timeline pieces. So what we did is a little goofy. We took all the kind of wacky, not that, like, who cares the exact date that the USB drive was made. We took all the little not that important ones out and kept the hardcore history dates that you might actually want your kid to know off the top of their head and put them in the big box so we play with the hardcore history dates only instead of the, you know, when was the invention of chewing gum or something kind of silly like that. So we took the silly ones out um, just because we want her to really have a sense of when these happened. It is more fun if you have crazy ones in there like the invention of the rubber ducky and things like that, but we're using it for game schooling, not just for being silly and fun. Um, my six-year-old does really absolutely love this. And she is six and a half, and we've been playing games for a long time, so she's a bit advanced. But it does say 10 plus, and that it's two to 10 players, and that it takes about 30 minutes. And that's pretty accurate. It does take about 30 minutes. Um, it can take less if and it's kind of interesting because the better you are at it, the faster the gameplay goes. So it has different ways to play with the cards. So there are five different ways to play with the cards. Um, you can do like a head to head. You can try to find um, where one specific card is along the timeline at the top. You can try to put the cards in order. You can try to place the cards along the timeline at the top, and you can try to guess the exact date, which is much, much harder. <laughs> and then you move your adorable little 
tokens, which are very Monopoly style, um, around this spiral board until you get to the finish line in the center. And that's pretty much it. But the actual cards are phenomenal. They're a very small, nice little size. So they're great to just put out in a timeline. So sometimes what we do is I'll separate out all the cards and I'll get um, all of the ancient world cards. And then she'll have to put them in order and try to guess. Or we'll get all of the hardcore history cards that we've separated out just into this box. And to do that, we did have to get a couple more tins to pull those out. And they do have, they have lots of tins. So they have like, um, oh, American history specifically. And they have um, ancient world specifically. And they have uh, dinosaurs. And they, they have lots of things. So if your kid is interested in a certain thing, by all means, go out and get that certain thing. But we kind of focused on events and inventions. And then this box comes with a ton all on its own that are more specifically history. And then we took the hardcore history dates out of these two and kind of put anything silly back into these two <laughs> um, so that we can play primarily with the big board because she does like the visual of the big board. But yeah, lots of different things you can do with these creatively just to play with the cards themselves. And I do like that you can just throw a little tin like this into your purse and take it to the park, take it to, um, you know, wherever you're going and they have something to do. And it's something that they really can play all on their own. All right. Thanks for watching this one. So if you've seen some of my videos, you know that we love the Professor Noggins games. Um, we have most of their history games, so we've also got um, the geography ones, we've got Canada, we've got um, the explorers, but I just wanted to pull these ones out to give you a sense. And I think they're kind of great because they match up pretty easily. If you do classical conversations, cycle one, cycle two, cycle three, um, but they're really, really, really good, and even little kids can play at the advanced level pretty quickly. So as you guys know, if you've seen some of my other videos, we've been doing ancient civilizations this year real hard. So these do say seven and up. Once again, play by your kid's ability, not the arbitrary number that they put on the box. My daughter pretty much has all of these cards memorized and can't answer them immediately. And she can go all the way through the entire card. So we started off playing it the way that they intend you to play it, where you have a dice, you roll the dice, and you get to pick for little kids on the easy level, question one, question two, or question three. And then we've just turned them into flashcards because she doesn't really care about the dice anymore. She just likes flashcards. So we just go all the way through all six questions and she can answer them like that. So we're almost completely done with this game. Next, uh, we'll, we've started moving into medieval times. It is very, very cool. And I really love the illustrations on it. Really pretty. And then we actually haven't even opened up the American Revolution one yet because we're just not there yet. Um, but my husband is doing some super early American history with her just because he wants her to have that foundation as well. Um, so anyways, Professor Noggins games, absolutely great history games. Okay, this is the Keys of History board game. This is from The Good and the Beautiful. So you don't have to do the whole The Good and the Beautiful program just to get this game. You can go right on their website and order just the game. And even if you're not doing The Good and the Beautiful, highly suggest the game. So what you have are all these great little history points. Now this is their game for their year one history. It has absolutely, makes no difference whatsoever what grade level you do this with. My daughter does have most of these questions answered now, um, has them memorized, but you can see on the back, it has progressively more difficult questions, according to the game maker, um, for my husband. 
this particular card is hard regardless because he doesn't know much about this bit of history. But, um, you know, there are more easy ones as well. And it just goes through some major points of history and pretty simple gameplay. Basically, you move around the board. You put little black tokens on things you've already gone on. You roll to get to the next spot. Um, and you answer the card associated with that spot on the board. And you get points based on the card that you've answered. Um, what we do is we just have her keep the card. And then we add them up the end. And that way she gets a little bit of math in as well. So this is Explorers and Settlers History Game, also by The Good and the Beautiful. Once again, if you do not use The Good and the Beautiful, you doesn't matter. You don't have to have the history curriculum to be able to play the game. And you don't have to buy the history curriculum to be able to buy the game. So this is a matching game. You have definition cards and you have character cards and you try to match them up. So there is a key card that tells you the answers in case you don't know some of these because you have some fairly easy ones. And then you have what are, for me, fairly difficult ones. <laughs> like, I don't know who the Norwegian Arctic explorer who discovered the Northwest Passage between the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean in the early 1900s necessarily was. But with the little key card, we can start to match these up. Now... You can do it as a long matching game. This is actually one of my favorites to throw in my purse and do on walks. So I will, this is not the way the game is intended to be played. I will put all of them in order with the correct definition card. And as we go on our nature walks, I'll pull out the character card and she'll have to look at the picture because she, you know, she's young. She doesn't, you know, read read she reads but she doesn't read read um so look at the picture and she'll try to tell me who it is if she can't tell me who it is I'll give her the name then she has to tell me what they did if she doesn't tell if she doesn't know what they did I'll read the card and then I'll ask her again to repeat it back so that she memorizes it and then we also play the opposite way where I will read what they did, and then she'll have to guess who the person is. Um, but I don't show her the picture on that one. So two different little ways to play. Very easy to carry around on a walk. Um, very easy to throw into a bag. Great travel game. This is the Bill of Rights Roundup game, also by The Good and the Beautiful. I really love this one. The quality is great. The board is tiny. It's definitely a size. It all fits in this tiny little box. It's definitely a size that you can just throw all of this in a quick little bag. I don't know if your purse is quite big enough for this, but you can bring the whole thing or you can honestly just throw the cards in a Ziploc and you don't need the whole gameplay. It does say that it's for seven and up and that it's for two to eight players. Now, this one, my daughter hasn't super gotten into, but my husband and I play it. It is really fun, and I don't know if, um, you know, you guys are all political, but my husband and I really like kind of talking about politics and debating, and that's our bizarre little date night. So, nerds, right? So what you do is you read the case, and it always ends with a little question. And then it starts a discussion. And the other person goes and tries to argue um, their answer to the question. And then you get to read the answer at the end for how it really should have been. Um, but really great way to look at each individual um, amendment in the Bill of Rights and I think they come like kind of going in order, like First Amendment, Second Amendment, Third Amendment. But you kind of need to mix them up or else you're, 
you know, just talking about gun rights for, you know, 10 minutes if you do them as flashcards. And we do do things as flashcards a lot in this family. And then it has the like kind of control cards that tell you more specifically on each amendment so that you can kind of learn them. Really great for anyone doing um, early American history and they're learning about the Bill of Rights. This is a great way to really do a deep dive into it. Also great for classical conversations, cycle three. This is the Castle of Burgundy. Now this is actually the smaller version of the game. There is a much, much larger version, but I like small little boxes that you can take places. We travel with games a lot. Um, you know, we don't watch TV at hotel rooms very often, but we do pull out games and play them. Um, so this is a good travel size game. Not a good car game, but a good travel size game. Let's see. This box believes this game to be for those that are 12 and up. So we actually don't have our daughter playing this yet. My husband and I play this a ton and just a really nice little um, Middle Ages themed game. What she does when she plays with us is she'll be on a team. So she'll be with either my husband or myself and we'll be playing against the other person. Even though it is just a simple card game, there is quite a bit of setup to this and it does take a very large amount of table space. So that's kind of the downside on this one. I'm not going to go into the whole gameplay because this could be a 30 minute video just on the gameplay. It is that level of complex, but highly recommend this one, especially if you have maybe someone 10 years old and up, they could start really understanding it. I'm not going to do a whole nother video on this because I have already done a couple things on how we use these cards. I really love them. So these are from Golden Books, Crayola Kids Adventures, and it's the Trojan War box, um, discovering, discover ancient Greece, riddle me cards. So they have like riddle questions on the back and then the picture and the title of the card on the front. There are 52 cards inside. Basically, you tell people the little riddle things at the bottom. You could do it um, just giving them one. There are usually three on here. So you could just give them the first one and see if they can get it, then give them the second one, see if they can get it, then give them the third one and see if they can get it. And you could kind of play it like golf. Whoever has the lowest score wins. But the cards are really beautiful. And what we do is we have her tell stories with the cards so she can tell the entire story of the Iliad just with these cards. Um, she can tell me how to dress a hoplite soldier just with these cards. She can tell me what food people ate in Greece. She can tell me the um, three different types of columns, Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian. So we use them more as flashcards and we just kind of use the front. We can play the back game and it's fun, but I actually find the way we do it to be a little bit more engaging and a little bit more um, history based. It gets into some higher concepts, but perfectly good game if you just play as intended. So this is the good and the beautiful's history houses and it is part of their curriculum. I feel like this one comes maybe with level four. But once again, you do not have to use the Good and the Beautiful's history curriculum to be able to buy the game. You can go ahead and buy the game all on your own and play it. It's, they don't have to go hand in hand. It's just history facts. So you have the little backs of the cards and you read, you read the orange part. They try to fill in the missing word. They try to guess it. And then um, they have kind of the harder question at the bottom, the easier question at the top. 
and you go through and you try to build your history house. So the different history houses cover different periods in history. Really great little game. There are ways to make it a little bit more challenging with the gameplay cards, um, which move things around and, you know, give you a little bit more interest in the game. But if all you want to do is ask the kid questions and let them build their house, that works as well. So we've been doing ancient history and she's young. So the way we've been playing the game is we just pull out the ancient history cards and we let her build the ancient history house. It ends up being about a five minute game. And sometimes that's all you need. This is Top Trump. I've done a video on this in another section, so I'm not going to go into it super specifically. But Top Trump games, they are, you know, a dime a dozen. They have so many of these games. This one I really like because it gives some really great information. You have the definition, the picture, the story of that character, and then you have their stats. Basically, it's war. You pick what you're going to compete on and you say, okay, with the next card, I'm going to be competing on strength. And both people throw the card down and, oh, she gets to win because she's got a 22 strength and he's got a 20 strength. Okay, well, then we pull out the winner and we read their story. And that's all the game really needs to be. What, what we've also done is we've started matching them up to their stories um, so you know you can get both sides of the Minotaur story the hero and the monster you can and we'll put them in categories we'll say uh, all mythical creatures and we'll put them all in a category and then we'll do all heroes all heroines all damsels um, different things to try to get more on the learning side but Great cards, excellent way to get into the Greek myths, really in depth, and we have a ton of fun with them, so much so that she runs away with these and plays with these on her own a lot. Toledo. So this is a really excellent game for the Middle Ages. It is about a specific city in Spain let me see if it has age ranges on here. Okay. It is saying that it's for 10 plus. It's way too easy to be for 10 plus. It really is probably for six plus. Super easy game. I think my daughter started playing this when she was like four and a half, five. But what you're doing is you are building beautiful swords and taking them up to the palace to present to the king. You can also present works of art. So you get a little bit of art history in here, specifically for Spain um, and specifically kind of Middle Ages and Renaissance. And then you also learn about how to make a sword and you feel like you're kind of immersing yourself in you know, the Spanish Middle Ages. It's just really beautiful. There's lots of math because you have to um, have money that adds up correctly. Um, you have to roll and count the spaces that you go up. Um, you have to do some strategy because you have to figure out, okay, how many more opportunities do I have to get the thing that I need? And you have to add up correctly to be able to build the sword that you want in the amount of time it's going to take to get your guy up to the palace. So good amount of learning kind of hidden in the game. Really do love this one. Forget the 10 plus. You can play this as a little, little kid and be perfectly happy and find it to be a really fun game. And my husband and I play this all on our own. It is perfectly good for adults as well. This is not a review. All right, so just a disclaimer, we have not played this one yet. 
So this is Seven Wonders. Obviously, it's about the Seven Wonders of the Ancient World. You've got the Pyramids of Giza and the Lighthouse at Alexandria and the Mausoleum of Halicarnassus, um, the Statue of Zeus at Olympia, Colossus of Rhodes, yada yada. It has won all kinds of crazy awards. You can play it with up to seven people. It's four, ten plus. Um, lots and lots of little parts. So probably not a great game to have out with little, little kids around. The artwork's very beautiful. Um, it's won a ton of awards. We have not played this yet. We kind of found the learning process of the game to be a bit more challenging. So we just have not gotten into this yet. Azul. So even though I'm throwing this in as a history game, it's also just a logic pattern recognition math game. There's a lot going on with this, but it's really simple and really beautiful. Now they say that it's eight plus. My daughter, I think, started playing this when she was about five. Two to four players and it should take you about 30 minutes. So very good lesson length. Um, Basically, you have a bunch of really beautiful tiles. You're trying to fill in your board with all the tiles that you need. You have tiles in the center that you can grab from. So there's definitely strategy to it. Um, pattern building, some math. Well, the math actually gets kind of complicated up here on the scoreboard. I'm not going to go super in depth to it. But really gorgeous game. Highly recommend it. Absolutely beautiful. Tokaido. All right, so I only brought down one box off of our shelf for this. I actually have this in three additional boxes. It is a fairly complex game. It has lots of little pieces. And we have the deluxe version. So we don't play with the little meeples. We play with really beautiful characters. Um, little figurines. And we play with uh, the metal coins instead of the paper coins. So, yeah, we went all in on this one. We absolutely love it. So this is taking you on a little vacation through Japan. And you get to stop in little towns. And you have different things that you can do. Um, you can eat at the restaurant. You can go make a friend. You can go to the bathhouses. You can go shopping. You can go painting at different locations. You start off with these different little characters. And you can be, I think there's got to be like a hundred different characters you can be. And they all have um, different strengths and weaknesses. And they start off with different amounts of money. So you can play the game pretty much completely differently every time you play it. So my husband actually had a rule that... I am never allowed to be the same character twice because I'm a little too good at games for the rest of the family. So especially when we play with our in-laws and it is the most heavily requested game for um, our siblings and our in-laws. Um, so I'm never allowed to play the same character twice so that it's a little bit more fair because I'm a little too good at this one. I really enjoy it. But lots of little tiny pieces takes up a whole giant table, not probably something that you really want to play with a kid that has a short attention span. And they say it takes 45 minutes, add about 15 minutes just to the setup of it and the tear down of it because it does take a long time just to get ready and then to put it all away. This is Alhambra. I really love this one. It's definitely one that you as an adult would enjoy. It does say that it's eight plus and that it's for two to six players and that it takes 45 to 60 minutes. My daughter started playing this on the be on mom or dad's team approach to it when she was about five, I want to say, maybe younger. And she really does enjoy it. She doesn't quite have the attention span for the whole thing so a way to get around that is just to take out half of the tiles or to set a timer to make it go a little bit faster but 
even though it's a good history game because you're learning about the Alhambra and you're not learning a ton about it. You're just kind of immersing yourself in the really beautiful structures. It's a math game because it's, you know, buying things with currency. So they're secretly learning some math there, simple addition. And then they're also learning some spatial orientation and strategy here in the way that they place the tiles. Sagrada. Can you think of a more beautiful <laughs> game that you've ever seen? I don't know if I can because this one is gorgeous. Um, we will be using this for our Middle Ages unit study. It's not going to teach her a ton, but it's going to sneak in some math and some logic. So the idea is that you are a medieval stained glass window maker for a cathedral and you have to arrange your really beautiful mini dice into specific patterns. So you get um, pattern cards that you slide into your window cards. So like here's a window card and you get to slide a different pattern card into it and that gives you some of your goals and then you have other cards that look like this that give you other goals um, it's a fairly complex gameplay the first time you play it and then it's super easy and it plays very quickly so they are saying that this is for one to four players it should take 30 to 45 minutes and they say 13 plus because there is some math involved Try it on the team approach if you have someone younger and see how they do. I think once they've played it a couple times, they would definitely be able to play it if they are younger. It's a good one for adults and it's a good one if you take out some of these other challenge cards and you just have people trying to complete their window on their board. I think you can play it with younger kids, especially if you take out some of these other cards and you just try to simplify the game. It's definitely a game that would be easy to modify to your child and their abilities. Well, I hope you really liked some of those games. Please stay tuned, like, and subscribe, and we will be showing you lots more games and curriculum and books. Thanks.